Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant. Here is a compilation of one of the ongoing plot lines of my fan fictions that are used to explore and demonstrate the setting of Warhammer 40k, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. Many an entry is the result of a vote, as I will leave them on a cliffhanger and then get the gentle listeners to forge the narrative by voting in the comments so they can control the direction and events of the story. So if you enjoy any of these stories, then do watch the weekly entries on the guides and prepare to exert your own influence and vote on the storylines. Now, I very much hope you enjoy the following compilation, a lead up to my campaign at Abundance Tertius. We are beings of anger. We were designed this way, forged this way, by our history, our lineage, by the choice of others, by the will of the Emperor, with the agreement of his son, the angel, our father. For anger is necessary, and we have so many layers, built one upon the other, stacked like bricks to form a mighty tower of our rage, our fury. It starts at our birth and continues to grow more calcified with each year, each stage. It is our armor and it is our spur. It is our weapon and it is our curse. Sometimes I remember the tapestry of my life intertwined in ways that did not happen, could not happen. My dreams are a struggle sometimes. At others they are a clear pathway, a straight road, but always vivid and potent. I find it difficult to sleep outside my sarcophagus. I find it impossible not to dream when within it. I am not strange amongst my kind in this regard. This harkens back to the first time, of course. For us, it all begins in the sarcophagus. Our new bodies, our new lives, our new dreams, our new duty. For I am a son of Sanguinius, and his blood flows through my veins. I am an Astartes of the Blood Angels. My dreams often take me back to that moment, the moment I knew I would be a Blood Angel, or that I would die trying to become one. The moment my brother died. It all happened so quickly. We were stood atop one of the many crags of our Red World, up high, to see our prey. Alas, as I leaned forward, I slipped. I should have plunged to my death down into the red sands hundreds of meters below. Instead, Lucas' face passed mine as he leapt and grabbed at me and hauled me back to safety. But in this he overbalanced, teetering at the edge on his tiptoes before failing his battle with gravity and plunging over the edge himself. I scrabbled forward only to watch his face get smaller as his arms fumbled in the air. But he did not thrash. His face was almost calm, placid. He made a choice, but he was at peace with his decision. It was Luca's wish, always his greatest dream, to be one of the Sky Warriors. He would not go a day without proclaiming it. So bold was he that soon none doubted it. The day of his sacrifice was the day the Sky Chariots proclaimed the time of challenge had come, and the pilgrimages to Angel's Fall would begin. The irony. I told my father of the events of the day, and packed only that which I would need to travel the Rad Deserts to Angel's Fall. My mother was silent. My father merely nodded his agreement. The dream had to be made real if Luca's memory was to be upheld. He understood. Despite me only being a boy, he understood. Those days were hard. I was scrawny, yet strong, but burned and blackened by the sun and the sand. I was only barely recognizable as human then. The trials were unlike anything I had ever experienced. So bloody, so brutal so uncompromising. A mere fifty of us were chosen, out of all of the hundreds who came. 
of those who survived those bloody days. But the fire of Luca was with me. I had somehow caught it when he grabbed me, when he saved me. His fire passed to me. His anger, his anger joined my own. And it burned all at which we threw it. It is how we pass the trials against those larger or faster, those older or stronger. We beat them down with our joined rage. More and more trials and tests continued within the fortress of the Blood Angels. We were all agog at the magic of the chapter then, being little more than feral nomadic plains people. But we were not given time to ponder. The training was intense and often deadly. All the while we, the denizens of Baal, were small and often misshapen, pocked or affected by the horrors of existence on Baal. Yet the trainers were all statuesque, chiseled demigods who seemed like animated marble masterpieces. They were so noble of bearing, so handsome, so perfect. None of us aspirants could understand how we would turn into things such as they. But eventually we learned. The final stage that triggered our gene seed would be the last and most daunting trial. For we would all be injected with the blood of the Primarch Sanguinius, and then placed in life-supporting sarcophagi for a full year to permit the change to take effect. As stated, I was scorny and misshapen, as were we all, so you can imagine the changes were drastic, took time, and were excruciating. Our bodies were changed slowly over that year. Our bones lengthened. Our muscle mass exploded. Our skins became calm and clear, and our very facial structures altered. Endless months of slow agony and endless screaming. The kind of screaming that makes your throat and even lungs burn. On your head feels it is about to burst through the lava-hot sensation being channeled to it by the nerves. Such pain without escape. But the pain was not the only bedfellow locked into our sarcophagi with us. There were the dreams. Dreams of beauty. Worlds so various and splendid that it strikes one dumb. Visions of the crusade. And the angel himself, our father, Sanguinius. Nightmares of betrayal and siege and final failure. Of battle and of death. For with the blood and its changing ways, also come the memories of our Primarch Sanguinius his struggles, his joys, his victories, and his final death at the hands of the arch-traitor, Horus Lupercal. The images, the dreams, the memories, the pain, the change, the year, locked away. You go through the midst of madness, his deepest, darkest well, only then to rise and go through to the other side. All the while, the angel is there. From the second the blood is transmitted, he is there. For it is the angel, his memory, his spirit, that meets us at the end of this journey, welcomes us back to the light of sanity, oft just before the sarcophagus is opened. Not all survive the ordeal. Many an aspirant has passed their last seconds enclosed in the sarcophagus. None have ever gone through the experience easily. Or have, at least once in all of that time, wished for it to be over irrespective of how. When that lid is finally lifted, slid off by a coterie of sanguinary priests, what comes out does not even mildly resemble that which went in, either physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. When I awoke, I was calm, and greeted those who exhumed me as brothers. I soon looked upon my new visage, the perfect form, the incredible height and power, the clear skin, the golden hair. Yet my mind had changed as much as my body. My interior now matched my exterior. In every single way, I had been born anew. Few talk of it, few acknowledge it. The rage inside that box, not just due to the inherited feelings of our gene father, not only due to the curse of our seed and the subsequent curse from the forces of the enemy. No. 
or so simply by being locked in a box and left in agony for a year, being shut away in the dark with nothing but pain and majesty. Like a thousand-folded blade, these layers of anger were not only added, but hardened, forged into our very souls. Our life had been pain, our emperor had been betrayed, and our father slain. The bright dream of a utopia stolen, the knowledge that the people of Baal were left in our misery just to provide better candidates, the knowledge that we would know no other joy than to fight and then die for the Emperor, our people, and our chapter. We sacrifice our humanity, our place amongst our people, for one reason alone. To defend them. Rage. We are the directed rage of the father betrayed, the angel slain, a dream destroyed, a people in danger. I, Rubio Misaro, captain of the Blood Angels, a true son of Sanguinius, will never cease in my vigil, nor would any of my brethren Astartes of the Blood Angels, for without us, Without the Blood Angels, without our constant vigil, without our constant war, without our constant rage, surely. Imperium Nihilus, nearly a full half of the Imperium of Man, would fall. The captain passed his blood-red helm to his subordinate and began to slowly trudge down the hill alone. His footfalls were heavy and his shoulders down. He looked at points as if he would fall to one side or the other, so ungainly was his stagger down that hill, toward the place he never thought he would stand, to the place he never wanted to be, to her dead body. As he approached, he felt all of the weight of the years on his shoulders. Every last decade, every last second of his long, long life felt like a mountain on his back this day. He looked at anything but her, his pauldrons with the blood-red tear on them, his mighty gloves, one being a power fist, to the sky above, covered in pillars of smoke from lingering fires as it was, but calm and tranquil. It only made things worse. He had not been able to do it, even after Baal. The disconnect to reality was too stark, the skies filling with Xenos of a blinding array. Not when they hit and so many of his brothers died. Not then. Why now? He did not know, and he did not want to know. The grinding emptiness of chairs around tables Names ceremoniously erased from lockers. The list of his brethren who would never raise bolter or chainsword in the name of, of the angel and the Imperium again. He had witnessed it all, understood it all, accepted it all. But this, this was the final straw. The day he never thought he would see. The day he never imagined would come and the floodgates opened. Centuries of conflict and madness and battle and loss now overwhelmed him. The lone armored man approached his destination and like a martinet with its strings cut, he toppled forward onto his knees, like all vitality had been removed from him, washed away by the outpouring of grief. He could walk no further now, now that he could see her, now that he could not avoid seeing her as he rested his head against her cold form. Now that he could not avoid seeing what they had done to her. And it began, quietly at first, tears begin to leak, then more and more like a river. His breathing escaped his control and came in shudders as he opened his arms to place his open palms on her, as he tried to hug her with all of his remaining might. She was gone. He began to whisper, knowing she would never answer him. 
never show sign of life again. Do you remember how we met? <sighs> that day on the flight deck, preparing for the drop when you would not let me aboard. Not until I had proven myself to you. The others laughed so hard at me. I admit, I started embarrassed and then turned angry. But you always knew how to make me laugh in the end. How long we played together until the final klaxon went off. Our first campaign. Barely knew my bolter from my braces then. How many times did you save me just in that one campaign? And every campaign since. It's why I refused promotion or transfer time and again, old girl. So I could be with you. But Baal changed everything. You have to know that. There were simply so few of us left that I had no choice. If the decision led to this, then I swear I will hate every day I have to wear the mantle of Captain. I wish you could hear me and tell me it isn't so. Some sign. Anything. You turned the tide again, old girl. Like so many times before, you turned the tide. We're on our knees. But you came, unbidden, but you came, as always. We were pinned down and our attack had faltered. Decapitating strike turned into a pitched battle. I underestimated their will. We were low on ammunition. And you came. I know it was you who led the rest, despite being left behind. We thought we were protecting you, but should have known you'd not be left out. Not while we were dying. If you had not hit that flank, girl, we could have been wiped out. So many of my brothers lived to date because of you, girl. But why did you then do it? Why take on the night? Why take on the night? Why? We were saved and you could have taken us out of there. I know you could have seen things better than us. Knew what was happening better than us. With your eyes. But why? A glorious kill, old girl. But the cost was too high, too high. Look what I have done to you. The warrior pushed his head up against the metal sides of what remained of a thing that had fought with his chapter from before the angel himself was found during the Great Crusade. The mangled and melted wreckage of the mutilated land raider still smoked, but no spark, no light, no single sign of activity of life came from what remained. And he wept, like he had not been allowed, permitted, or felt possible to weep for centuries. She was gone. I will miss you, girl, so much. Captain Rubio Masado stood from his place next to an ancient and now wrecked land raider, his countenance somber, his bearing regal, as he proceeded to rejoin his men, waiting quietly at the edge of the bowl. He looked each man in the eye as he spoke. Now we finish this. We take our wrath to the very heart of this incursion, this invasion. We strike at the dragon in his lair. There was no cheer from his gathered marines. There were but stoic nods of assent. Hours passed, and the battle had been intense, the marines pushing further and further into a last conurbation that had not been purified and pacified. Heading towards the center of the disruption, the thing that had called so many forces of the dark powers to its cancerous collapsion. Yet the enemy would not go down so easily. 
demons streamed towards the Blood Angels' ranks, despite all the pinpoint accuracy of their bolt shots culling the throng. Yet still, they would hit. Unlike many other chapters, other legions, who would perhaps fall back in orderly squads or stand their ground and fire until they had no further choice, not the sons of Sanguinius. The Blood Angels countercharged, a tactical squad, no chainsaws or jump packs, they charged nonetheless, using their bolters as precise bludgeons and all of the strength of their armour and skill, they fought forward. The red demons in front of them met them with all of the force and rage of an ocean. Yet, they fell back under the punishment these red-clad marines were dishing out to them. Every sword swing parried, every bar blocked, with counter-strikes that destroyed the beings first time, every time. But they were just the wake, not the prow. At the tip of the V, the top of their spear point, was Captain Rubio. With his power sword crackling blue energy and his infernus pistol blazing, Captain Rubio Masaro strode forward, never missing a step, never slowing, never relenting. Like a god of war, he felled all before him. In the center of it all, his rhythm set his mind blank. The captain heard what at first seemed like the beginnings of an auditory hallucination. But then it became clearer, a voice in his mind. One he had never heard before, yet recognized immediately. My curse grows within you, within you all. One day, I will have you all. One day you will be lost within your rage so much that you walk into my realm, from which you will never escape. One day the Blood Angels will fight for the Blood God. One day the Blood Angels will collect skulls for the Skull Throne. Give in. Be the first. But you will not be alone, for every one of your brothers will join you in their trickles and in their droves. My curse grows within you. Be the first, and you will be the mightiest. Can you hear me when I think, while I destroy your minions? As you hear, so are you heard. Then I shall give my response. How dare you? How dare you put out such a fetid fare as if it were a banquet? Before you stands a son of the angel, a son of Sanguinius, and I know thee, Cabanda, proclaimed minion servant Lickspittle of Corn. Yea, but Lickspittle is too high an epithet for thee. You are an echo of an echo. You are nothing. I shall explain it to thee once alone. For there is something you cannot understand, cannot fathom, cannot grasp. Not if I gave you all of the experiences, the lies, the achievements, the senses of every being who ever lived. From the first sea beings who gazed up into the first sun, to the final sentience that will witness the last star burn cold. Not if I gave you a thousand, thousand lifetimes to ponder these experiences. Not if I gave you until the end of time could you possibly understand. You think yourself a mighty demon prince. Yet I know thee for what thou art. You protest of power and infallibility. But if that were so, why hound my door with your begging bowl for supplication and service? I know you to be an echo of an echo. A dream of a being that calls itself a god. But in reality it is nothing more than a collection of the misery of everyone's bad days. We have something you will never experience. Never possess. We are the sons of the angels, aye, the sons of the emperor's design. Despite having greatness running through our veins, we are but human. And we have something you will never, ever have. A choice. So I say to thee and your master and all of the cohorts of his minions, I say it but once and once alone. For now and for all time, get ye hence, take thyself from my door, demon. For I choose to be a true son of the angel, and I will never bow to the likes of thee. And come what may, I am at peace with this decision.
The storm raven hurtled through the skies towards its target like a lightning bolt. Through fields of fire, flak and small arms aimed up at it. Most was evaded by the furious action of the incredibly skilled pilot. He was used to the task, delivering his fallen brothers to the very centre of the fray, its very heart. But he always kept the comms from the central section turned off. On his first drop, he had kept them on, but the lesson had been learned. Oh, how it had been learned. For he had heard what they said. He heard what was being spat at them by the legendary Lemartes, guardian of the lost. And on that day, he near lost the command of his faculties. He nearly fell into the chasm that was the rage. Now he thought only on his task, had to concentrate on this one moment, for even the memory of those words would threaten his soul again. Inside the main compartment of the specially altered assault vessel, the same thing was happening as it always did when it was deployed. Le Martis was with his brothers of the Death Company. He was whipping them into a froth of rage that would make even a coronate berserker take pause. The forces of our enemy, the Great Betrayer, await us, brothers. We have but moments before we are unleashed. Remember the faces of the foes you slay today. Remember when you strike what they have done. They have betrayed the Emperor. They have betrayed the Crusade. They have betrayed humanity. These lapdogs and lick spittles of Horus and his vile ilk. These traitors deserve the fullest extent of our wrath. The sons of the Angel. The sons of the Emperor. These vile curs are without honor, without courage, without virtue, without glory, without any redeeming feature. For they are the basest of all things. They are vile and deserve our righteous fury. They deserve the cut of our chain swords, the blessing of our bolters. They deserve to be crushed underfoot, and we shall give it to them. For they are the most despicable thing ever to arise from the human race. They are traitors. They betrayed our lord, the angel. They betray our master, the emperor. They betray our entire race. They cavort there beneath the very walls of the imperial palace, looking for a way in, looking to slay and slaughter our brothers who guard that mighty and hallowed wall. They look to lay their rough and unclean hands on the emperor himself. Shall we allow this? Do we permit these vast scum to bray and bluster at our very walls? Do we allow them the nefarious scheme? Do we allow them to defile the halls of the Emperor? Do we allow them to hack and claw and spit on our very Primarch, our father, on Sanguinius himself? Do we allow them to trample his image, to wipe their boots on his wings? Do we allow them to defecate on his body? Do we allow them to then slay our Emperor? Do we? Then buckle your bolters and let rip thy swords and chain thy fury, thy wrath, for this day we will destroy the traitors. The cabin hummed with the whir of chain swords as the light turned green at the hatch and it was swiftly thrown open. Some fifty feet beneath were densely packed a veritable sea of enemies. None wore the power armor of the named traitors, none the emblems of chaos, but to the men who jumped from the Storm Raven right into their midst, there was nothing but the images of the sons of Horus overlaid onto their true visage. As the Death Company carved a bloody path through their opposition, their arms moving faster than was deemed possible by their foe, wounds that would have killed even Astartes, severed limbs, broken bones, did nothing but fuel their rage. Nothing stopped them as they carved through the madness-induced illusions of what they now saw as the traitor mass. Forms that would soon all be dead as the wrath of the Death Company chewed through their ranks like whirlwinds of unstoppable rage. It had been hard fighting, and it had been long. This sight, 
this mausoleum to martyrdom was where they had drawn a line in the sand and decided to make their stand. Where once they capered and rutted, where they performed their debased hedonistic foulness. Now this is where they fought for their God, they fought for their lives. This is where they besieged their foul master, and their throats ran hoarse from the screaming of its name. But this was where the angels of midnight had also decided to end the matter. And it was going apace, as intended, to schedule. But that was the lie. The patterns of madness that allowed these angels to justify what they were doing. For there could be no other word for it than extermination. From the one perspective, the side of the people of Issacharian Alpha, this was unjustified slaughter. They had been alone. They had been cut off from the rest of the distant Imperium. They had been beset for months, tortured and hunted and destroyed. Their city smashed, their entire people on the brink. For when the great tear across reality had opened, the lights went out. And the Xenos aliens had swept in when the Imperium was napping, and they had harvested humans like cattle on this world. They had swept across the world and killed or harvested all, before then mustering just outside of the range of the last remaining human weapons of any note, just outside of their main capital. And to the Xenos it had been more a celebration, a gathering for a festival before their attack. They had been so certain of victory that they celebrated it before the deed was even done. But none who huddled in that last city could see any way that they would fail. They had little in the way of defences, few tanks or materials of war remaining, and nothing they had done before had availed them any good. The Xenos had been too much for them even when they could field entire regiments of planetary defence forces. But on that last day, when only this, the capital, survived, it was then that the people of Isokarian were saved. In their darkest hour, on the very dawn of what considered most to be their last day, their deliverance had come. For storms had arrived out of nowhere as the enemies gathered around for their last assault. Those storms covered all before and around the city, the last human sanctuary on all of Issacharian. They raged for six days and six nights. And when they abated, when their fury was finally blown out, the Xenos were gone. All were scoured from the planet. All. The people of Isakarian were then informed, instructed, instilled with the faith of the being who had saved them. And it was not the Emperor. Some of the new priests stated it was the Prince of Pleasure, Slanesh. He'd been contacted by a single man, one who would later be made king in all but name. This man had prayed for his entire world, his entire people. He had prayed for deliverance, and they had received it. At first, the rites and ways of worshipping their new god seemed a massive festival, a carnival of colours and music and song. For their new lord, their new protector, he was unlike the dour emperor of mankind. He was a lord of life and love and laughter, and he celebrated them all to abundance. Yet as time went on, as it always does, the rites became more involved, less structured, more bacchanal, more extreme. And as the years passed, hedonism and debauchery became the norm. The cavorting couplings went from private affairs to writhing carpets of sweaty grunting, animalistic rutting across every road and alleyway on high days. The gutters running with blood, when the sunset and a red moon leered down on the horrors they performed upon one another in the name of their dark benefactor. And none saw how far they had fallen, how far they had stooped, until they were confronted by the returning extended family of humanity, who were, quite rightly, utterly repulsed. And they saw in one brief look 
that the people had turned to chaos. From the perspective of the Imperium, the world had been left to its own devices, left to look to its own defences, because there was simply no way to get to them in time. The warp groups had been cut off, the galaxy darkened for a time, and when the lights went back on, communications were possible again. Then the galaxy was ablaze. Worlds uncounted had been attacked, entire sectors had been ravaged, and in that time it was only those worlds that kept beaming out their distress calls that were placed on priority, as they were the only worlds that the overstretched forces of the Imperium could guarantee still had any populace left to defend. So Issacharion was presumed lost. And when the combined force led by the Angels of Midnight reached the world, they had expected to drop off the contents of a colony ship and move on. But instead, they found that the world had not been washed clean of humanity. Quite the opposite. It had been contaminated by them and their twisted heretical beliefs. The deliberation was less than a heart beating coming to a decision. And so, a Sicarian Alpha was then beset by an almost identical event so similar in nearly every way. The forces of the Imperium hit, and hit hard. They set about scouring all human life from the globe. And it was, again, their capital alone that held out. Or at least, it did. Now it was on the verge of its final destruction, for the commandment of the Chapter Master of the Angels of Midnight had been as predictable as it was complete. All human life on Issacharion was to be wiped out. Of course, but this place, the seat of power, was to be flattened and the ground salted and glassed. But as with everything the Angels of Midnight did, it would be thorough. They had to make sure that every single last Chaos worshipper was dealt with before they took to orbit again and laid it waste. Every single last one purged in the name of their father, the Angel. Forever was the Angel known to give warning, then, if ignored, to lay utter waste to any who denied the power and righteousness of their cause. And thus did his sons, the Angels of Midnight, set about their bloody task. The poor defenseless people of Iscarion were not to be underestimated, however. Or more to put it, their Dark Lord and Master was not. For as they marched into the place after the guard had shelled it for a week without break, the Chaos forces had twisted many a normal human cultist into a travesty. Creatures came charging out of every angle, what were once human. Now all were rising, screaming things of flesh, horrors to be put down. And in these engagements, the Bolter had, as always, reigned supreme. Yet it was when they came closer to the center of the place that things got worse. For as a last resort, a desperate gamble, the people there had sacrificed a huge proportion of their remaining number in the most terrible ceremonies any had yet performed. But the angels of midnight were ready. Their deep midnight blue power armor was no longer proof to every attack from the resisting cultists, no. For now death stalked the city in the form of the Neverborn as well. Creatures of the warp permitted to gain entrance to the material world by this dark ritual. The tactical squad had moved forward, thrusting into this last seat of impurity along with the rest of their company. The sergeant finished scanning around him and ducked down behind the wrecked walls again, between the howls of pain and pleasure that echoed around the entire landscape. There had been deeper rumblings. Something big was on its way. But it was not demonic. It was a very old, battered and barely serviceable demon rust tank. Behind it crept entire walls of twisted scum. For its lack of sheen and polish, the battle cannon on its top was no less lethal, no less destructive. Far from its one large gun barked out and removed much of the cover that it was pointed at. The sergeant knew his men could handle the hordes of scum, knew they would finish them all eventually, be it by bolter or by fist if necessary. 
but here in the silken darkness was where the angels of midnight had learned to be lords, fighting their twisted brothers of the night for centuries uncounted on a world cut off by the murder storm. They had learned all right. Now they were the kind of terror that usually found itself in the clutches of the vile ones, the corrupting powers. But despite this unceasing hell that they had lived in, they had never broken, had never devolved, never become creatures of unreasoning slaughter, or so most believed. Their millennia-long isolation by warp storm cleared by the tear across the galaxy. But when they were found by the Indomptus Crusade, they were nearly wiped out themselves, until their true nature was discerned. For they appeared so much like those that they had learned to fight, the masters of the shadows. No raven guard were they, certainly. But of all of the sons of Sanguinius, they were those who dwelt in shadows, gained strength from its dark embrace, and they had been absorbed into the crusade, brought back into the Imperium proper, given new Primaris marines and equipment enough to return them to a full chapter in materials and ships and all of the resources of war they would require to lead their own splinter crusade force. But now, their age and passion, their love of lord and race and tire, meant that they were the hammer of the Emperor, and they indeed walked where other angels feared to tread. When the tank rumbled to the neck of the road which they moved up, the tactical squad broke and scattered. Like shadows they moved, while one always made distraction and drew the eyes of all. But from one to another would the watcher be drawn, as they took it in turns to scuttle, creep, skulk, and then charge out for a second, always confusing the enemy, until they were closer. All the while, the tactical squad's one heavy weapon was firing down on the tank, missiles hitting more often than not, but then usually seeping into a coloured mist around the tank. Little damage. It was piling up, but it was slow going. A glamour of field erected by the twisted power of its dark master. And it was a distraction as well. After the first missiles were on target and failed to cripple the old fossil, the sergeant knew he would have to get up close and personal with it. Hence the firing of their missile launcher, the bolter rounds, the drawing of attention this way and that. All of it was done by his squad, so the sergeant could get into position. He more than managed this, of course. He was an angel of midnight. And thus it was he found himself four stories up, looking down at the rear of the tank as it passed beneath him. He only had one shot at this. It had to be good. The sergeant slowly exhaled, raised his bolter up, but it was not the bark of the Emperor's own wrath, the bolter, that finally rang out. Before the sergeant squeezed the trigger on his weapon, he switched it to its secondary mode. For the gun was rare, and although not as old as many, it had an underslung attachment, a single shot of a powerful melter charge. Just the one, for situations just like this. And when his shot flew out and vaporized the air between him and his target, he knew it would run true. The one melter shot slammed into the back of the tank, exactly where he had wanted it to be and the effect went into its armour and superheated it until it literally melted. Burning liquid metal dropped into the tank and set off a chain reaction that led to it exploding on the spot. The sergeant stepped back from the window as the tank exploded, then returned again to look down at his handiwork. The vehicle was gone, taking over a score of vile scum with it. But now said scum were nothing more than a milling and confused mass, and the sergeant drew out his chainsword, hit the one chevron ordering his men to attack, then put his foot on the window sill and stepped out. He fell down amongst the milling crowd of tainted heretics and cut loose. As he did, his men, all nine of them, appeared out of corners and shadows and alleyways. None would escape their wrath this day. None. The lieutenant held his rage in check, but only barely. 
He knew it was wrong. He knew he was incorrect. But his eyes told him a different story. Despite the protestations of his mind, his heart rebelled. They were being left to die. He had seen the bloody mess that was his captain, who had returned from his first meeting with the chapter master, the legendary Gabriel Seth. What a possessed the madman to beat his new line officer to within an inch of his life. What kind of general would he be to these men? The Primaris that just so happened to have the blood of the angel is very seed in them. For most, reunification with their designated chapter had been a moment of celebration, of camaraderie, of homecoming. But not so for those Primaris who had been sent to wear the colours of the Flesh Terrors. They had been viewed with suspicion, sneered at openly, or even ignored when they first arrived. Then their captain had been dragged out of his first meeting with the chapter master in a bloody mess. There was real concern amongst the Primaris and the lieutenant was now seeing all of their fears come true. His captain had been leading from the front and was heavily engaged, so he left his number two in charge of the field oversight, the tactical overview. So it was the lieutenant could see the battle progress, could see its ebb and flow, and the Xenos tyrannid filth appeared in numbers far greater than had been projected. Far greater. He had informed his captain, but was met with a snapped answer to inform Central Command, nothing more. And thus the lieutenant had done so, but received no response. Nothing. It had been minutes, and in a battle sphere as complex as this one was turning out to be, even seconds could make all of the difference. His hand hovered over the button that would reissue the message. Everything told him to hammer down that button again and again until his communication was at least confirmed as received. The bugs were not as stupid or animalistic as standard citizenry were told. Not one bit. He knew that they could have disrupted communications. But if he did hammer away at the button, did send the message again and again, then he could be sent again into a room full of laughing firstborn. He could be seen as weak, desperate, unable to hold the line in the face of the enemy without panic. And that would translate to all of his Primaris brethren. Neither option was worthy of him sending it again. But what if they had not received the one message at all? Would he doom his entire company out of hesitation and pride alone? His hand continued to hover for another whole minute. But then the decision was finally taken out of his hand as a new chevron appeared on his screen. At first, he had thought it would be the precursor to a wave of them, but it was only one, no more. The drop pod slammed through the atmosphere and landed directly in front of the main thrust of the enemy, where the lieutenant had stated would be the most hazardous and vulnerable zone of the battle, the crux point. Other primaris in front of the line looked to the skies, scanning for more pods, but saw nothing. Not until the drop pod opened. Its tentacle-like coverings jettisoning off from well-placed charges on its hull, the ramp slammed down hard, revealing its contents, and each Primaris on that gun line took in a sharp intake of breath in sheer shock and horror. A wave of clawing, chittering and screeching tyrannids hurled themselves forward, crashing towards the drop pod. So many. But inside the drop pod were only five Marines. Four elite First Company veterans, the best the chapter had to provide, the Sanguinary Guard in their golden armor, and the one man none of them had expected to see. For in the midst of the four Sanguinary Guard, walking down the drop pod ramp, and then immediately beginning to pick up speed, as he seemed to charge directly into the very heart of this oncoming tsunami of flesh, it was him. It was the chapter master. It was Gabriel Seth himself. He had come personally. And something the lieutenant did not expect then happened. It happened spontaneously. It happened all across the line. And it happened with such speed that he could scarce believe it. For as the chapter master charged headlong into his foes, and began to cut a huge sway through them, it began. A low rumbling at first, then louder and louder, until it filled every comm signal, every helmet. A bellow of anger, a bellow of rage. As one, 
The Primaris units across the sector stood and bellowed their rage as they leapt over their defences, abandoning their Codex-compliant positions. They charged. The lieutenant could not believe his eyes and ears, as over 30 marines charged as one to save a man who they thought despised them, who they thought had led them into a trap, who they thought would never, ever accept them. But despite it all, there was one thing more powerful than any of that. Any concern, suspicion or doubt, the one and only thing that actually mattered at all. The Primaris saw. Their chapter master was in danger. Their lord was amongst his enemies and in danger of drowning amongst these filth. A fellow space marine, a human, a hero of the Imperium was about to die unless they acted. And thus it was that the Primaris Marines broke every level of subconscious training they had received from their previous tutors, smashed every tenant and control, allowed the blood to sing in their ears and to guide their very actions. Like sons of Sanguinius, they charged! Gabriel Seth was like a force of nature, his two-handed giant chainsword, Blood Reaver, carving out such a tally of destruction that it was hard to keep up with him. His every movement, his every action, twist or sweep, every single last motion was an attack. He was unstoppable. As the Primaris slammed into the Tyranids trying to encircle the Chapter Master and his guard, they turned the tide very quickly, and in mere moments, Chapter Master, Sanguinary Guard and Primaris Marine were all fighting side by side, shoulder to shoulder, tearing the flesh of the enemies of the Imperium, the enemies of humanity, as one. None who fought that day would forget it. And none of the warriors in the Primaris who saw their chapter master in action doubted any more. For he had come. He had come and he had fought for them. With them. He had bled with them. And they had bled for him. He had taught them without sermon, without lecture, but by action. What it was to be a true son of Sanguinius. He had shown them the way. And from that day forward, there would never be any doubt any more. For in that moment, when the blood was up and the foe in number, these men, these Primaris, they had proven that they were not shallow clones or cuckoos in the nest. For they had proven themselves true sons of the angel. They were flesh terrors now. And proud of it. And all due to one man, Gabriel Seth, Chapter Master of the Flesh Terrors. I am a captain, have fought for humanity for centuries. But had never wanted this, had never sought it. With the Tyranids, they killed so many of us on Baal. The flower of the chapters, the vast majority of their successors of the Legion of the Blood, were gone. Yes, we had new blood, new replacements, new Astartes. Primaris. But they were larger, different, from vast stasis crypts. They fought bravely. Like sons of the angel, they were faster than us, stronger, so sure of themselves, so effective. At first, I thought they were here to replace us. Shattered as we were, but with the word of the chapter master, Dante, and the avenging son of the emperor, Rebuk Gilliman himself to support them, they were blood angels now. But were they the blood angels now? And so it began but had to be done swiftly. We integrated them, did so as fast as we could. But there was something that came out in the wash, in the observations, in the meetings, in the measuring. They were warriors born, well-equipped, hardened over the duration of a crusade. They were marines. But they were missing something. They were not fighting at their potential, because they were walking Codex Astartes. They fought like ultramarines. Not entirely but far too much, so we taught them. But it was abundantly clear they could not be given leadership positions in the highest tiers yet, 
One day, definitely, but not yet. They did not have the experience to command with the new tweaks to their doctrines. They were not yet adept at our way of war. So it was those of us that were left, those with the talent, if not the desire. We were promoted. There were so few of us left, you see. And I could not deny my duty any longer. So Rubrio Messaro became a lieutenant, and swiftly after a captain. I was there when my predecessor was cut down by the most horrific of battles I had ever yet witnessed. And today, I am reminded of it more than any before. Because today is a very special day. As our battle barge slows to approach the station, I am aware that everything will now change again. For with them amongst us, I can do naught but try even harder. None can bear to fail in their presence. But why does my mind wander so? Because I explain to myself, I justify why I, a captain of the blood, am secretly in more than a tiny bit of awe. And I hope it does not show to the men. I was promoted quickly to lieutenant, then a field promotion to captain only a decade later in that fateful event. So I had not been of high station for long, and the chapter had been at constant war, constant crusade, constantly moving, pushing out into the Imperium Nihilus, reclaiming worlds in the name of the Emperor, and the regent. Our own chapter master, Dante, had been named the regent of the entire northern half, the dark half of the Imperium. The pressure I can only imagine. We all now feel it slightly more, though. But not like normal men might. Not to the point where we can be paralyzed or become ill or inadequate. To the point where we all are more aware. No, we set a higher standard. We were the chapter, the marines, the heralds and representatives of the regent himself. We were his angels of death. We had to lead the way. Not just to our successors. Not just to the greater, wider brethren of all of the chapters in the northern half of the Imperium. To every guardsman, every tank column, every naval formation, every planet. Every man, woman and child under our aegis, our protection. We were now a symbol in the north whereas the Ultramarines and others were the symbol in the southern Greater Imperium. And we had to win. Always. Now more than ever. And it could be hard. But we were Astartes. All of us. Old and new. We stepped up. But due to my brevity of tenure, the inevitable had never happened until this day. Until this new briefing, this new quest. For it cannot be named anything other than that. And I am nervous, if that word could actually be attributed to any of my kind. It is what I would call it anyway. But I am also filled with quiet joy. For what we have been tasked to do will require the best out of every one of my men, and me. And their mere presence will bring it in abundance. For on that basis a full squad of them, the legends, the heroes of our chapter, the Sanguinary Guard. Each one a fabled warrior, the vague cream of not only the chapter, but of its most illustrious, most skilled, most powerful veterans. And then the blood runs so pure, the resonance of the angel's soul reflects so brightly. I've only witnessed them in battle but once. The reason for all of my explanation of my unwanted yet meteoric promotion, I had never had them attached to my units before, let alone attached to... Me. But now we were approaching, but never planning to stop. The Storm Raven and its escorting storm talents were the only things in the foyer between us and the station. Replacement for losses we had sustained on campaign, prioritized to us due to the import of our mission. But it was the Storm Raven we all watched, even I. All my brethren, bar the lieutenants, and I had their helms on. They could mask their awe. We could not. Discipline. The raven lands, they walk down out of it, each moving so smoothly, they seem more to glide than walk. Yet it is not ephemeral or feminine. It is more like a hovering forwards, not like ghosts, but like that which they are, beautiful but powerful warrior angels. Their golden armor shines, and their masks, those metal death masks that burn with the light of the emperor, the light of the angel, they are resplendent. 
everything we feel we should all aspire to be. But they are also the most deadly of all of us. The most powerful Astartes the Emperor commands outside of the Grey Knights, some say. And today, I believe it. I believe. And they are here to guard me, to protect me, as captain. Both physically, morally, and with the priesthood, spiritually. Their example alone, their presence amongst the men, the army, the company. It will show all of the brethren that we are in the right. That we are righteous. For how could such as they fight for anything other than the most pure of causes, the most noble of quests and goals? And everywhere we go, the men and women of the Imperium, from the meanest hiver to the most exalted planetary governor, will know that they are blessed, for the truest sons of the angel are with them. They stand forward and take their oaths to defend me for the duration of this campaign, and all cheer when it is done. They cheer. Something I have not heard in many a long month and year. Already, their glory, their presence, begins to shine through us all. With them with us, with me, we cannot fail. We cannot. For we go to a crux point in the schemes of time, I am told. One of the great battles that defines the future, the path of the galaxy itself. Not forever, of course, but for a time. A crux point at which the blood angels must be present, or all is lost. Kobulu himself has foreseen it. And now, for the first time since I received these orders, now I feel we may just win. Because the chapter ancient of the Sangare Guard has in his hands, towering over all of us, filling us all with even greater pride, he has a sign. He carries a banner from the Arks, sent by the Regent himself. We will go to war under the banner of the chapter of the Blood Angels entire. We will not lose. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. I hope you've enjoyed the story so far and will join us on the weekly entries as a result and will like and subscribe. If you do, then hit the notifications button as I would not want you to miss out. And so, from both myself and Mrs. B, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.